So for example, in this case, my input variable is f dash naught x. Um, what makes the what makes it a first order? We'll talk about that next time. Uh, yeah. So first order <coughs> system, systems, second order systems will be our focus next week. Okay, and if you recall what we did at the end of last class is we said, well, remember that this variable f naught dash the dash emphasizes the deviation variable is What if that f naught dash is simply zero? In other words, there's no deviation. So we said that if f naught dash of s equals zero, then h1 dash of s is also zero. So take this f naught dash of s over to the right hand side. It's zero now. There's a zero over here on the right hand side. H1 dash of s then is equal to zero. And if h1 dash is equal to zero, that implies that the deviation in height over time is zero. In other words, if I make no change to my input, I'm going to expect no change to my height. This is totally intuitive, but the math bears that out for us. So don't touch your system, don't move it from its current steady state. Remember our assumption last time for the transfer function, the really critical assumption is that these are deviation variables from steady state, and we're assuming we're at steady state initially. So if I'm at steady state, make no change to my flow rate coming into the tank, I'm going to see no change, always in deviation form, in the height of h. Now let's take a look at something a little bit more interesting, because that's pretty really trivial and expected. Let's consider now, and this is our new material for today's class, well, what if the change coming into my tank is a step input? So what do we mean by a step input? So now consider a step input. So a step function, a general step function, is equal to zero for all times prior to time zero. So there's nothing initially. And then we'll step up by a height capital P for times t greater than or equal to zero. And if you've got your flash transform table there in front of you, uh, take it out and take a look at what the flash transform of the step function is. So this is line two in your table. <coughs> so line two in your table is for what's called the unit step. The unit step is, to illustrate this, uh, in a picture, the step function simply says that I'm initially at zero, and then at time zero I make a step, and then continue on. This is in the time domain. And this red curve is a function of s of t, and I'm making a step here of height p. So the Laplace transform of this function, s of t, if we take the Laplace of that, is equal to p over s. So in the table in line 2, you've got what's called the unit step. That's if your height p here is equal to 1. But I'm going to generalize this. Let's take a step of any height. And then that will pass transform to P of S. This also applies if you take a step down. If you take a step down, your P now is negative P. And so then your pass transform is that P captures the negative sign. So you'll have minus something over there. Okay, we're going to see next week how we take the past transforms if we're doing things that are not at time zero. Next week is all about shifting away from zero. 
let's uh, take a look at this idea though. Before we go and derive what the system will do, what do you expect? Here's my height in the tank. Okay, so let's work in deviation form. H1 dash of T. So in deviation form, I'm initially at steady state. That implies that if I'm working with H1 dash, I'm there at zero. <coughs> What is going to happen to the height of my tank if I apply that increase in the flow rate in that step? For example, will the height in the tank in this Okay, so people are shaking their heads. It's clear that the height in the tank is not going to react in that manner. So how will it react? We've looked at this before, in fact, over a period of time. So it's going to take some time to reach a new steady state, right? But you agree on that. There's going to be some time taken. How is it going to approach this new steady state? Okay, everyone's kind of seeing this. Okay, it's going to do that. So the system is going to respond and do something like that. If I take a step, if I took a negative step here, so instead of going up by plus p units, if it went down by minus p units, I'll see the reflection of this curve going down. Okay? This is the nice thing of working in deviation form. We'll simply work around zero and things have a natural reflection. So we're taking positive or negative steps. Now the question that we're interested in is what is this change? Okay. We're interested in that obviously because we don't want that tank to overflow. If I increase say here by 2 meters cubed per minute, that's my inlet flow goes higher by 2 meters cubed per minute, is my tank going to fill up and overflow? Is my height going to exceed the height of the tank and then overflow? Or am I, is my tank capable of handling this increase? That's one of the things we might be interested in. We might also be interested in how fast it approaches this new steady state. So let's take a look at, at how we can answer that. As you might expect, we're going to use the transfer function and multiply our transfer function by this new input. So my transfer function, h of s of s is r divided by r a s plus 1 multiplied by f0 dash of s. What is the f0 dash of s for a step input? Well, we've got it up over here. F0 dash of S is equal to P over S. We're putting a, a step input on high P. So given that then, H1 dash of S is equal to R times S multiplied by R P and R A S plus 1. input that was here earlier in the denominator, take it over to the right hand side, substitute what that input looks like in the Laplace transform. So this is my step input. And what I get then is the Laplace transform of the output. And the next step obviously is to take that back to the time domain. So we can go do that quite easily. So go ahead and find what H1 is in H1 dash is in the time domain. So you've got your tables in front of you. Go ahead and quickly do that. H1 dash is the deviation form then. <coughs> <laughs> Which 
line do you use? Line 13, okay. state as time goes to infinity is a coded way of saying what is the final value of that function. So if you use the final value theorem, we can have just as easily recovered that same answer. So this was an important theorem we learned about last time, it started this week. So let's just quickly get a chance to reapply the final value theorem. check with the final value theorem that we get the same answer. Okay, so remember the final value theorem's utility lies, for, lies in the fact that we can use it in the Laplace domain. We don't have to come back to the time domain using line 13. We could have simply used this function over here in the, in the box. We're asking what is the final value of that height? <coughs> okay, so the final value theorem tells me that the limit as time goes to infinity for h1 dash of t, I could have just as easily recovered that in the Laplace domain by saying what is the limit as s tends to zero of s multiplied by h1 dash of s. So save myself the hassle of inverting in the time domain. Let's work in the Laplace domain. So confirm that that final value theorem gives you the correct result. So let's quickly do that over here. So S multiplied by H1 dash of S, that's going to give me S times RP in the numerator multiplied by S rps plus 1 in the denominator. Take the limit as s tends to 0 okay, 
so we get a bit of cancellation there with those two S's. Now as S tends to zero, you get RP. So we get agreement there. And that's good to see. So initial value theorem and final value theorem save us quite a bit of time to check our answer. You should regularly use them. Even if it's not asked in a test or exam, or when you're doing an assignment question, always double check initial value and final value anyway. I have a question for you the law of the part where you have F9 dash of S, plus the of S, and then Alright, the line above that, and the line below that, are both H1 dash of S. So you have different things. Like, I'm thinking with that, how can you find the plus, a plus one thing? So F9 dash of S, the line Let's uh, take a look now at a different input. Okay, so here we looked at a step input, which is really easy to work with. What do you expect if the flow rate into the tank is the RAND function? So Mark had asked a few classes back, what does that RAND function look like in three in your table. Let's draw the RAND function so that you know what we're speaking about. So the RAND function says, let f0 dash t have the following. The RAND function says it's doing that. Okay. There's time, the flow into the tank is being ramped up. This is your operator sitting there and opening the valve 1% every minute. And they go to 2% a minute later, 3% a minute later. There's a constant increase in the flow. And our question is, what does H of T look like? Any guesses? So that's my input over here. I'm asking, what is H dash? My output going to look like. So I'm starting at time zero. What is the height in the tank going to look like? Okay, so zero times zero, and then after that. What is the output <coughs> going to look like? Yeah. So keep opening that valve. Okay, so before we had this shape, okay, that was for a step input. But, okay, so a step input before was was this. Okay, this is my step. This over here is my ramp. Okay, so now instead of putting a step input into my process, what's going to happen with the ramp? You get the same response? So it would be similar response will start later. Similar response that will start later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Okay. So let's take a look at what Laplace tells us. So the Laplace transform of that type of input could be quite interesting. Let's work through it over here. So now this time instead. My transfer function is still the same over there, but I changed the f naught dash. So this time, what is f naught dash of s? 
for a rat in quotes. <coughs> what is f <coughs> 1 over s squared. 1 over s squared. Okay. So my input this time is a little different. Instead of p over s, I'm putting in 1 over s squared. So h dash 1 of s is equal to r in the numerator. And in the denominator, I get s squared rps plus 1. What does that look like in the time domain? Oh, sorry, R A. Maybe let's ask the following instead. What is going to be the steady state final value for H1? So use the final value theorem. Remember the utility of the final value theorem is that we can do this inversion. I find the answer, sorry, without doing the inversion. going to be the final value of H1 dash? No notes? So we won't 
the practice they reach infinity. Real systems don't reach infinity. We don't ever have that in practice. Furthermore, if you think about it, what we're asking is, is this flow to go infinitely large in a ramp, and we don't have the capacity to even implement that flow. So realistically, we will never actually experience this, but on paper we can write it out. So it doesn't mean to make it true. But the key is, this does have meaning to us. So let's just make a note here. While in practice, we can never reach infinity. Okay. This result is still important. It means that our system is unstable. So this is a new term that we're introducing. And it's a term that we're going to be careful of because we never want unstable systems. So this result implies the system is unstable. Okay, that's a key concept. Systems that do not reach a new steady state. So when we put a step input into the tank, we reached a new steady state and we kept operating. Now we're saying that if we put a ramp input into my process, the system is going to have this tendency to get larger and larger and larger. We'll never really reach infinity. On paper we will. But what this does mean is our system is unstable and we don't like unstable systems. Right. They've heightened that tank with some toxic liquid um, or it could flood an environment around us, then that's a safety issue. We're <laughs> by like 1% every time. Or eventually at 100%. Right. So I'm saying a, a practical okay. case, we cannot even implement that input. But the result is still an indication that there's instability in our system. And we want to avoid designing systems with instability or designing control systems that cause instability. So a big focus three, four weeks from now is going to be making sure that the control loops we design don't make our system unstable. You can take a stable system put a feedback control loop on it so that the total system now becomes unstable. Okay, and we don't want that either. This is going to be one way we check for that. So I just wanted to use this as an example to illustrate what we mean by stability. So the H1 prime is represented by that one figure Yeah, H1 prime will go up that way. Now, the next important concept I'd like to introduce here is we focused a lot on what F1, sorry, we focused a lot on what H1 is, the height in the tank, but we've not really focused on what that flow out is. What is F1 doing? So let's just quickly talk about F1, and that discussion is going to raise a new concept that I'd like us to be aware of. So let's. Uh, Let's take it in the following perspective. Okay, what will happen to F1? And I'm going to write F1 as a function of time. Okay, so if we make a change to my flow into the tank, so let's say I increase the flow here with a step input, what am I going to see on the flow out? We focus what's going to happen to the height, but we haven't really focused what's going to happen on the flow. And the reason why I'm doing this is we're going to start to see that the system, though surprisingly simple, actually has some interesting complexity to it. So we know F1 of t is equal to H1 of t divided by r. We're told that. Well, we can go apply the same technique we did earlier. We can go say, well, what is that at steady state? So at steady state, we can write that as F1S is equal to H1S divided by R. Then I can subtract as before, and I get F1 minus F1S is equal to H1 minus H1S divided by R. Then 
Then I can go define deviation variables. And notice I'm following the same recipe as we did before. Again, something that's now very, very straightforward to us, and we're going to do this regularly. So create deviation variables. And let's call it f1 dash is equal to f1 minus f1s. And h1 dash is equal to h1 minus h1s. So if I rewrite that equation in deviation form, I get f1 dash is equal to h1 dash over r. What's the Laplace transform of that equation over there? Maybe if I rewrite it in the following way, it becomes obvious, or more, I would say not obvious, but very clear. If I rewrite that equation to emphasize the time domain dependence, so f1 dash t is equal to h1 dash of t over r. If I take the Laplace transform what's my left hand side? F1 prime of f1 prime of s, right hand side. Cool. So F1 prime of s is equal to h1 prime of s. Let's emphasize what the transfer function is over here. We've been speaking about transfer functions for a while now, so let's take a look at rewriting that in transfer function form. How would you write that in transfer function form? What's your output? What's your input? <coughs> Your input is the height, and your output is the flow. Okay? So if my output is the flow, the transfer function for the system, this is a system, this is a valid system, it's just a really small system. It's telling me what's going on in this region over here. That height comes in as my input, and it's determining the flow out as an output. So it is a system, it's perfectly valid to consider that a system, and so we can write f1 dash of x over h1 dash of x is equal to 1 over r. Now recall that previous comment I wrote on the board where I said we're going to start to look next week where we write our system in the form of a gain divided by a time constant multiplied by s plus 1. Okay. What you can see is happening here in that process, in the system, is tau is equal to 0. And so what we call this is a pure gain system. So this result over here we we'll sometimes see it referred to as pure gain system. And the reason is as follows. It simply says that, if you look back right at this equation where we started from, the original time domain equation, it says that if I change the height in that tank, my flow changes right away. There's no dynamics in this process. You change the height, that flow instantaneously changes to a new value. Another way you can see it is that the time constant in this process or in this system is so small that essentially the response is instantaneous. One of the reasons why we teach process control isn't so that you just go off and design feedback controllers. One of the major emphasis of this course is that you understand process responses and dynamics. So this is telling me, this equation over here, 
a change in the height leads to an instantaneous change in the flow out. It is no delay in seeing that response. And we see it here in the, in the Laplace transform version as well. Okay. We call that a pure gain system. It's a pure gain system because there's no time constant. Remember what we said about time constants a few classes back? Do you want short time constants or long time constants? Right. So the closer they get to zero, the closer and closer our systems get to become what are called pure gain systems. We might work with pure gain systems because we get an immediate response on them. Now let's step this up a notch and look at what's happening between the flow out of the tank and the flow into the tank. So it's essentially what I'd like you to think of now that we have this knowledge. Can you come up with a transfer function that relates F1 to F0? So go ahead and give it a shot. <coughs> okay, so what is this over here? We would like to know what's going to happen to the flow out for a change in the flow in. How would you find that? So let's put up that previous equation. We had previously that previously we had H1 prime of S divided by F0 prime of S was equal to R divided by R A. That's plus one, right? So this was my transfer function from before. That transfer function relates the height to the flow in. This transfer function relates the flow out to the height. So you can start to see where this is going. We've got two systems in here, two systems that are in series. Here's the first system that tells me what's going to happen to the height if I change the flow in. The second system that follows it tells me what's going to happen to the flow when I change the height. And what do we know about systems in series is we can chain them up. Okay, so the system that's in series tells me there's going to be a new rule that we're going to learn about. We could write that as follows. This can be written as F1 dash of S divided by h1 dash of s multiplied by h1 dash of s divided by f0 So systems in series, we can multiply the transfer functions. We get a little cancellation here. We get the result. So what is this transfer function now? <coughs> One divided by R A S Right. Okay, so I'll just make it uh, emphasize it a bit by lighting out the two transfer functions side by side. We get a bit of cancellation there with the r's in the numerator and the denominator. And that's equal to 1 over RAS plus 1. So then finally we write the flow out of the system F1 as a function of the flow in F0. So we're going to generalize this next week. And where we're going to go with this is I'd like you to think of the following. We've got a few minutes over the weekend and you want to extend it a little bit. Consider this system now. 
where this flow alpha now, F1, which we said was H over R. Well, what if this flow is the input into another tank? So here's a second tank with height H2. Okay, and this tank has an outlet flow with another valve, and here's flow 2 is equal to H2 over R. So what we have is basically a duplicate of this first system, except the only difference is now the flow out of the first system is the input into the second system. So we're starting to build up chemical plants right now with this idea. Like a chemical plant is never just one single unit. Like we have a reactor, a separator, distillation columns, packaging lines, and so forth. And they're often in series, so we need to understand what happens when we build up the process. So we've spent a lot of time going thoroughly through this derivation for the first system. The second system is trivial because it's a pure gain system. Now I'm saying take this knowledge that you have, copy and paste it and put it side by side in series. And essentially what's happened is we've got another two more systems added here. So if I had to draw this, essentially here's my third system. <coughs> that relates F1 to H2, and my final system relates H2 to F2. So what I'd like you to think about, and it's quite straightforward to derive, but essentially I'd like you to think about the derivation for F2 dash of X over X0 dash of X. How many systems do we have in that sequence from F0 to F2? There are four systems. Okay, so we can multiply the four transfer functions throughout. And I, let's just start to use some terminology we're going to really get into next week. This over here in the blue box is a first order transfer function. It's a first order system. Okay. Now what do you think you're going to get when you put two first order systems in series? Overall, it's going to be a second order system. So I'm going to teach next week about first order systems, second order systems. We're going to look next week at this function over here. So here's my here's my function function for that system. We're going to understand what that numerator means. There's a very special meaning for what a numerator equals to one means. We're saying that the gain of this process is 1. So we look for the gain of 1 and then what happens if we put 2 of them. So I'll see some of you in the tutorial today. The rest of you, I'll see you all.